So hello everyone and happy 2022. My name is Stefan van den Wildenberg. I am a postdoc in the Royal Research Group at UCSD. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this first Polarity in Chemistry webinar of 2022. To begin with this year's webinar series, we invited Professor Markus Kowaleski from Stockholm University. But before starting the webinar, I will first make a few announcements. In 2022, we will keep hosting our monthly Polarity and Chemistry webinars. Like always, we will keep sending you emails advertising about the next Polarity and Chemistry webinars along with Zoom registration links. Um, to stimulate the exchanges amongst our community, we maintain a Facebook group called Polarity and Chemistry Online Community. This group is not only intended for us to share information about the webinars, but it is also meant as a space for you to share your research and your ideas. So whether you are particularly excited about one of your latest publications, or if you want to share about a new position that's open in your group, please share it in the Polarity and Chemistry uh, online community. If you missed one of our webinars, if you want to catch up with some details you missed in the previous session, or if you're eager to rewatch your favorite talk, please remember that we upload all of the webinars on our YouTube channel named Polarity and Chemistry Webinars. If you want to keep up with uh, the webinars every month, please consider hitting the subscribe button. Finally, I would like to uh, introduce the mechanisms of the webinars. So during the talk, attendees are all muted. For those who have questions, you can click the raise hand button and I will interrupt the speaker at an appropriate time and enable your audio to ask your question. Also, you can type your comments or ideas using the chat function so that you can share them with everyone. For Q&A, you can type your questions there and uh, they will be addressed at the end of the talk. For the questions that are not answered due to the webinar time limit, we will collect them and send them to the speaker after the talk. So now let's back to let's go move back to today's webinar. It's our great honor to have Professor Markus Kowalewski from Stockholm University as our speaker today. Professor Kowalewski got his PhD from uh, in 2012 from uh, University of Munich in Germany and was awarded the uh, Dr. Klaus Römer Foundation, Foundation um, Thesis Award. After a two-year postdoc in Uppsala University, where he studied molecular wave packet dynamics and femtosecond pump prop spectroscopy, he joined UC Irvine here in California as a postdoctoral researcher and then as a project scientist. During these years, he notably investigated cavity femtochemistry, non-adiabatic processes, and tried to understand how one can monitor and control molecular dynamics coupled to optical cavities. In 2018, Professor Kovalevsky joined Sc Stockholm University as an assistant professor, where he still is today. For today's webinar, he will give a talk entitled Photochemistry in the Strong Coupling Regime and Non-Adiabatic Perspective. Please join us to welcome Professor Markus Kovalevsky. Professor, now the floor is yours. You can share your screen. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for the nice introduction and thank you for having me for this uh, seminar today. Um, yeah, as you can see from the title, we are going to look at uh, strong coupling and I thought um, I change a little bit this perspective here and focus a little bit more on the non adiabatic dynamics effect of the of the whole uh, subject. But first let's uh, start out with uh, with some acknowledgements I mean the, the results i'm going to show today. The main people here from my group are Eric Davidson Mahesh Gudem, and Thomas Schnappinger who were involved in those and also, of course, uh, thanks to the rest of the group and to all the, the funding opportunities who make this work um, even possible. So first I will start out with a little bit of a quick introduction. I don't think in this uh, community I have to say too much about the motivation and everything. In the second part, um, I will look a little bit at the different representations of the photon mode and uh, the molecular interaction with the photon mode, since this over the years is something where we have now very different options and very different things how we can uh, calculate dynamics. And I think especially to summarize that all could be nice, especially if you're a newcomer. Um, all those different possibilities um, may, be, may be quite overwhelming. And then in part uh, three and four, I will actually 
talk about the results uh, from two of our latest papers, one where we look a little bit into the role of dissipation, which I think has been a little bit uh, underappreciated in the beginning. And in part number four, we will go full in non-diabatic dynamics and actually look into uh, um, controlling, trying to control a molecule that already has a, a conic letter section. So uh, to set the stage here, I mean, what are we looking at? We're looking really at tightly confined light modes um, in, in micro cavities and nano cavities. We want to go into the strong coupling regime, of course, um, but and potentially even the ultra strong coupling regime. Um, from what we've seen so far in, in at experimental developments, this is something that should not be too far out of reach anymore. And I mean, of course, uh, the, the chemist's dream here is that we can, of course, modify potential energy surfaces and modify the potential energy landscape to really uh, control photochemistry or potentially even ground, ground, ground state chemistry. I mean, coming from a, from a background where I've done a lot of uh, optimal control theory in, in my PhD thesis, um, it's also interesting, of course, to see this as a kind of new tool instead of using laser pulses now to use some more static elements like cavities um, that have different control parameters to see how we can control a, a molecular system in general. And of course, can you really change the outcome of a chemical reaction? That's, I think, the big, the big elephant in the room that uh, people have to uh, try to answer over the, the last few years. And just as a little side note, as you see here at the bottom here, this, this kind of uh, picture where we have put molecules into a, a completely different type of cavity, actually a macroscopic cavity back in the days in, in 2007, where we actually tried to do cooling, molecular cooling of internal degrees of freedom in, in molecules. So I think this is not the only example over, over the years where people have uh, tried to put molecules into cavity and to do different things with it. But this is, uh, this is one, of, uh, one example from my own work. So, uh, I mean, of course, what, what basically motivates the whole work are here in this, the initial works of, of Ebison where they have shown that uh, for photochemistry, they could actually modify reaction rates by putting molecules into this fabry nano nanocavities, um, which kind of indicates that it's actually really possible to have some kind of handle on uh, potential energy surfaces uh, by means of strong light meta couplings in, in this kind of uh, micro cavities. But also in general, I mean, as you see here, like indicated by those uh, other example pictures, it's not necessarily only Faber-Perot cavities that, that could be an interesting target here, but also um, other types of cavities or even plasmonic systems that provide probably different, uh, different control principles in the end or different opportunities. So now I want to I want to take a step back and step back a few years and basically start out with a, with a very simple picture that how we thought in the beginning that um, this whole thing molecules and cavity could actually work so a little bit of progression here so I mean of course we have a cavity mode a standing wave between two mirrors and the, the most simplest of pictures. Um, if you quantize that field mode, you get Fox states, which basically behave like a harmonic oscillator. And what uh, Tevis and Cummings have done in the 60s already is to couple that to write it down for an atomic model and then couple that to an atomic transition, uh, this, this kind of light field, this quantized light field. And what you get out is stress states. So a James Cummings model is a beautifully simple model that includes all the necessary information. But of course, when we go to molecules, things start to look a little different. So we have a nuclear coordinate right here indicated by a reaction coordinate. And now if we look at a very simple model where we have a bound ground state and an unbound excited state, and we put 
that together with the James Cummings model so that we can address states, then we already see, okay, we can now uh, create a bound state character in the excited state with by means of the dress states. But uh, very early on, by, by looking at this, um, people have figured out, okay, it's not that simple anymore. It's not just this uh, simple James Cummings model, um, but you actually start to get um, non-adiabatic interactions at those points of where your light field is resonant with the molecule. And things are a bit, a bit more complicated than uh, one might have initially thought. Um, and this is only for the single molecule perspective. If you go into the, the realm of uh, collective interactions, which is probably really the holy grail of the field at the moment, then things even become more complicated. But actually today I'm going to talk about only about single molecule interactions um, and present that from, this, from a single molecule perspective, even that might not answer necessarily the, the questions of how this really works in experiments. But I think there are a lot of details at the single molecule level that are still worth looking at um, and to get a deeper understanding of the whole, of the order processes. So now next step, um, yeah, let's switch a little bit gear and see how we can actually set up a molecular James Cummings model or extensions thereof. So in principle, what we always do is when we, as a theoretical chemist, when you start out, you start out with the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, of course. And if you write down our molecular Hamiltonian, we have a um, kinetic energy for the nuclei, which in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, we immediately move. And we only look at the electronic parts, at the electronic degrees of freedom. And what you would usually do is you would go to your favorite quantum chemistry program, um, basically solve the electronic part of the problem and you get your Born-Oppenheimer surfaces. And if you do this for varying uh, nuclear configurations, you get a Born-Oppenheimer surface. So this is um, basically everything before polar atomic chemistry. So then if you take a look at the electromagnetic field, uh, things are much less com complex here at the first few. Um, the field behaves like a a harmonic oscillator, and we can write this down here in atomic units as, for example, as simple Fox states with the annihilation and creation operators. Or, of course, you can reformulate that to have a pseudo coordinate, so called photon displacement coordinates, where you have a, um, a photon displacement coordinate and conjugated momentum, and write that in some kind of position space. And then if you, if you want to couple that, we have light matter interaction here uh, in, the simple, in the Fox state case. Um, we can write this with a simple transition dipole moment between electronic states. And then also with our annihilation, uh, with our annihilation and creation operators for the photon mode or for the electronic excitation. Um, of course, you can reformulate the same thing here for photon displacement coordinates, and you get a similar term. And if you write it out correctly, what, uh, what other people have done, you probably even get a little bit more of uh, physics of that, which I will get into later. So, but let's start out with a simple uh, Fox state perspective. So we have a simple basis, electronic states. Let's just call them G and E here for a ground state and an excited state. And basically the Fox state uh, basis for the, for the photon mode. And then if you build a product basis out of that, we have our field free states as they come out of the quantum chemistry program. And we couple that um, with the photon mode, then what we basically get here are the product states, which then simply cross. So to say this from a, from a chemist perspective, they behave like diabetic states. They just cross through. And you have, in terms of uh, coupling between the photon mode and the, uh, your electronic states here in this model, uh, this is the same thing. You have a delocalized um, coupling that depends on the dipole moment or the transition dipole moment in the particular case of electronic states. So then, of course, we can diagonalize the picture. And then certain things uh, start to change. We get, of course, the dress state. Um, or as we also call them, the upper and lower polariton states. And if you're in the Tevis Cummings model, you also would get so-called dark states. Um, of course, in this picture, we diagonalize basically the, the, 
the surfaces that we've created up here, together with the coupling that comes from the cavity mode and the, uh, the dipole moment. And what you then get are avoid, avoid the crossings, basically. And also that the style of your coupling changes is you become uh, delocalized, sorry, become localized derivative couplings. So you're dealing with derivative couplings now with which when you do want to do dynamics could of course be a bit more challenging from a computational picture. But from the chemist picture, I would say this is the adiabatic picture or dress state picture behaves like the adiabatic picture. So now if you use that dress state picture, um, this is basically doing non-adiabatic um, dynamics on those, those kind of uh, light matter coupled surfaces. And you have to calculate those non-adiabatic um, couplings. And what we've shown in one of the first papers is that you can basically, since the, the James Cummings model is more or less analytically, you can write down those non-adiabatic couplings in form of an analytic expression, which in the end um, contains your um, the tunings with respect to the cavity mode and the excited state. Um, the gradients, differences, and the derivative of your transition dipole moments, for example. And then if you want to do uh, quantum dynamics on those surfaces, for example, then you're dealing with the whole set of issues, what you do with, what you have to do when you deal with non uh, adiabatics couplings or derivative couplings. So then the, the other alternative that I mentioned initially is that um, we can also basically go to something which looks like a position space representation, the so-called photon displacement um, picture. And here, this is basically a um, textbook, more or less textbook um, harmonic oscillator. So you can replace your field annihilation operator by uh, x by something x and p, where x is your field displacement coordinate, and this is some kind of behaves like a conjugate uh, momentum. And um, then you can write down, of course, the Hamiltonian more like um, a typical harmonic oscillator with a harmonic potential, or something at least which looks like a harmonic potential. You can write this photon displacement coordinate as a dimensionless coordinate in principle. And if you do that, then you have, um, let's say you have a diatomic molecule, one internal degree of freedom here, which is capital R, and you have uh, another degree of freedom um, for the photon coordinate. So the nice thing is now that, or at least if you look at it from the perspective of quantum dynamics is that you can deal, the treat the photon mode and your vibrational um, coordinates more or less on the same footing numerically from a numerical perspective. And this is illustrated here by actually showing the, the wave function of the, of the photon mode for, for example here from the sodium iodide. We have here the, the coupled wave function in an electronic ground state and here you have a coupled wave packet in an uh, excited state. So then um, of course here again, as you can see already from the coupling term, it's like you're dealing again with delocalized um, couplings that are fully position dependent not derivative couplings, not non-adiabatic coupling terms. Um, but this picture also has another nice um, advantage that it automatically, if you formulate it like that, it automatically includes your counter-rotating terms, which you have handled uh, at once, which may be a little bit more cumbersome if you go into the Fox state basis. So and then last but not least, um, our colleagues from Hamburg, about Angel Rubio and uh, Michael Rugenthaler, they came up with the so-called cavity von Oppenheim approximation. And I think this is really something that's worth another look to, to fully appreciate what's, what's going on here with the cavity von Oppenheim approximation. So basically, this, let's say, uses a starting point, the normal von Oppenheim approximation, what I've already shown you in one of the, the slides before. So you have your purely your electronic part, which would something correspond to like you can solve with a normal quantum chemistry program. So then in the cavity born of Mahama approximation though, what you do is you actually add the field also um, to your Hamiltonian. So here working in photon displacement coordinates, of course. So here you have the harmonic potential from the field um, 
and here you have the coupling of the um, of the field mode with the electronic degrees of freedom here via the, the dipole operator. And if you do that derivation correctly, you also get this dipole side energy time. Which actually probably might be important for uh, extended systems, like we see that in, in collective coupling in, in polariton chemistry, or also if you go to higher local field strengths. So now in the cavity born of my approximation, what you can do is like you take your conventional electronic Hamiltonian and the full field Hamiltonian, add that up, put that basically back into a quantum chemistry program and solve then for so-called uh, cavity born of Mahana surfaces. And here you get out um, full surfaces, which are of course then where you have to vary your nuclear degrees of freedom and also your photon displacement coordinate. So if you really think about it, how this is how this works, um, this is again nice because you get everything at one shot. And it actually includes, this is even another level of theory since it includes much more physics now all of a sudden. Since you really allow for the, for the, for the electric field to really interact um, at a much higher level with your electronic degrees of freedom. And if you do that, let's say you solve now again your surfaces, for example, at the CAS SC level, CAS SCF level of energy, you get out a surface for the ground state, you get out a surface for an electronically excited state. So then if you want to calculate transitions, now we are back into a non-adiabatic picture. So now we have to deal with non-adiabatic couplings and derivative coupling terms again, as you can see them here. Uh, in the simplest case, uh, single derivatives with respect to your nuclear coordinates and also your photon displacement coordinates. And I think this is a very nice feature because especially when we want to look at molecules that uh, include already natural conical intersections, and we want to couple that with a light field, that we can treat now everything on the same footing and uh, pro probably have much better access to the problem. All right, um, but now let's uh, change, switch the gears a little bit and have a look at um, another type of problem, like at um, the role of dissipation actually in, in polariton chemistry. And if you, we look at this, this is kind of, I would say this is a little bit of a typical experimental limitation dissipation because in, in practice, what we do is we have bad cavities. I mean, all the experiments or many experiments that are out there they're dealing with um, low, low Q cavities, which means that um, if you have half a wavelength, uh, let's say between the plates or, or something like that, the life at those Q factors below 100 or so, the photon lifetime is way less than 100 femtoseconds. And when we look at the nuclear dynamics, the chemical processes where this is actually important, then we will realize that, okay, this is something that happens uh, at the same time scale. So this is something we should actually take into account to treat this properly. And yeah, it looks like that, that this has been actually a little bit neglected until just recently. And uh, just here picking the first few papers where people have been thinking about that. Looks like, um, I guess the first uh, COVID lockdown was very inspiring here. If you look at the dates at when those papers came out. So of course we also did that. We looked we looked at that problem, and what we did is we tried to see, okay, let's let's get as much as we can into the model, and let's look at the Lindblad equation, and use Lindblad terms to to describe um, the photon decay, the cap, the loss of photons from the cavity. So we have a full uh, density matrix equation, a full Lindblad equation where the density matrix itself includes our electronic systems of the electronic states of the system. It also includes um, the nuclear wave packet. So this is probably then even a little bit uh, very nicely brute force. So you got everything in there and it has the, the cavity mode in there up to a certain Fox state number. And of course we can define here a cavity decay rate in the limp blood term and play around with that. So we used magnesium hydride here as a model system. I mean, if you talk to an experimentalist, this is probably not necessarily a system that you would try to implement in the lab. 
But I think uh, as a model system to understand really basic features, this is a very nice system, very well behaved. So what we do is we take the magnesium hydride and we see we have here uh, a bound state. Then we have two excited bound or one excited bound state and two unbound states. And what we want to do is we want to look at the transition from the black state into this purple unbound state here. So pump the system with a short pulse from, from X to C basically. So if you do nothing, if you just have the bare system, your magnesium hydride will um, dissociate in, in much less than 100 femtoseconds. So, but now we come up with a James Cummings type model and we couple the system to the photon mode which basically, um, if you take the product states here with uh, photon numbers one, two, and zero in the, in the relevant energy range. So then we get uh, a bunch of states here. And the most interesting states that we want to excite to here are the, the dashed ones up here. So again, we're exciting from the, from the ground state zero X, basically into zero C here, so up here. Now you can see all those states are crossing with, with, with other states where the cavity is resonant, with the A and the B states also, and partially even with the X state with two photons, a ground state with two photons. And now we solve the Lindblad equation for that system and we see what happens here. But as you can see already from the system, we have potential many crossing point possibilities here where we can exchange photons with the cavity and get some interesting dynamics. So what we use here as a, Sorry, as a professor. Uh, outcome basically is the remaining population or the remaining molecular population at a, after a certain uh, time. And you can see here we have, so basically zero means a molecule is gone, is completely dissociated and everything that is above zero means there's some molecular fraction remaining. So that then we can vary the, the cavity decay rate here, uh, drawn as a mean lifetime, and we can vary the electric field strength. So for the bare molecule, molecule in the C state just associates. And if we start cranking up the field strength here, we see that we can actually trap the molecule in the, in the molecular state and preventing it from, from dissociating, or at least significantly delay dissociation in, in a sense. So if you look at this uh, sectors up here for, for large photon mean lifetimes, uh, A and B, and those parts, is, it's basically almost irrelevant to take this uh, photon lifetime into account because it's so long that uh, it doesn't affect us here. But as we start making the photon lifetime much shorter, like going here to the white line, which is roughly the, well, the photon lifetime is roughly equal to the, um, to the dissociation lifetime of the, of the molecule. And then we start seeing actually that the life, that the fraction of molecules that we are able to retain basically decreases. So you increase uh, dissipation and basically controllability uh, reduces. Coming from an optimal control theory background, at first glance, this is uh, actually very intuitive. You're Introduce dissipation means you start losing controllability over your molecule, over your process. So now what's actually interesting though, is if we make the, the photon lifetime even shorter, and here the, the, this dashed line, this dotted line is basically indicates where our strong coupling regime ends and we start going transition to over outside of the strong coupling regime. So if we go to that regime here, then we actually see that the lifetime or the the, the fraction of molecules that we're able to retain increases again. And I think this is, this is quite interesting. So if you go here to, to this uh, dashed line, which is basically the time it takes for one photon to transverse, transverse the, the cavity, um, then we have a kind of, again, an optimum where we start stabilizing the molecule. And if you go to even shorter lifetimes, I would say we're pushing a little bit out of the physical regime and then Again, again, everything disappears. So now, question Excuse me, is professor. What? Yeah, um, I, I have a question actually regarding these uh, potential energy curves for MGH plus. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's, it looks like the surface of the uh, photonic excited states are just shifted in energy with respect to the, to the field-free uh, potential energy surfaces. Do you account for the variation of the transition dipole or the permanent dipole of the electronic states with uh, the, uh, the molecular geometry? Um, in that case, we have only looked at the electronic transition dipole moments. So this is a purely electronic model. And that is fully included. So um, okay. the, basically in the, in the full Hamiltonian that calculates the dynamic, that includes uh, position dependent uh, transition dipole moment between all the respective states. Because I've been working uh, on LIH, so which is kind of an isoelectronic to MGH plus uh, minus a shell. And, and we, we saw kind of a charge transfer state that, that had a really increasing uh, dipole moment when you, when you extended the molecule. So I wondered if that, that nature of charge transfer state was also present in uh, NGH plus electronic states. Um, not that I'm aware of that this would be super important here. I mean, we have, uh, I mean, if you look at something like the lithium fluoride or the sodium iodide, yeah, then then I then you're absolutely right. Then you have this change of covalent to ionic character. Your dipole moments are huge, and they have huge variability. Then it then it matters much more. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so to understand how this works here, how we can actually stabilize the, the excited state here by means of the the cavity decay, I think this is. There's the, there are two different perspectives, and this is one perspective here. We can simply look at the potential energy surfaces, and what you see here, the little arrows, are our decay paths. From if you decay one photon out of the cavity, that's uh, that's the transitions you make via the Lindblad blood operators. So as you can see here, from your purple state, you can get already a little bit trapped up here, and then you can traverse immediately to the blue state and to the black state. And if your decay is fast enough, you can actually start saving the molecule from dissociating by decaying into a more bound, um, into more bound states and eventually even back into the, back into the ground state. And I think this is an interplay here of, of how fast this um, decay process is and how fast um, you basically dissociate. So that's why you get um, basically a minimum and an optimum at those, at those different decay rates. So I think this is a little bit maybe the obvious case, but what's maybe less obvious and not mentioned so often, I think, is that we actually can also look at the frequency domain pic uh, picture instead of just the time domain picture. And this means like um, we have to actually look at the cavity line width. So what for a certain kappa, for a certain cavity decay rate, how broad is the, is the cavity resonance in that sense? And here we have like three different cavity line widths actually plotted like for the three different sectors here, F, G, and H for, for those different decay rates. And you can see that this is a, a massive variation in cavity line width. So we go from a very small uh, cavity line with uh, in the sector F to a much broader line with in G and then basically outrageously large in the in our almost unphysical sector H. And I think this is um, very simply to explain with the means of spectral overlap. So you have to choose your cavity line with also in a sense to match basically um, the energy broad energy bandwidth that you have in your system. So the cavity line width here has to match the energy distribution of your nuclear wave packet that you have here and your, your electronic states that you cover. If, that, if, that, if you choose that optimal, then you have optimal coupling and you can get the maximum out of this effect, I would say. So to summarize this part, um, I mean, what we've seen, and that was actually pretty nice to see, I, th I think we're not the only one who observed that. Other papers also reported similar effects. Um, that is that photon decay actually can help and probably in experiments has a big influence in actually helping um, the results that you see. And then 
I think the little bit underappreciated point um, is that spectral overlap between cavity mode and system is, is important. That is maybe something to keep also in the back of the mind that there's a, yeah, let's call it a conjugate uh, point of view to that whole thing. And those, uh, what we've seen here, particular for those uh, short um, life photon lifetimes is that maybe plus non nanostructures might even be a good fit for such a system, which by nature have very short lifetimes. Sorry, Professor. Mm -hmm. We have a few questions now. All right. Um, uh, Joel, you may talk. Uh, hi, Marcus. Uh, so hi. Uh, I have two comments. So uh, one of them is that actually we did uh, study the effects of dissipation, uh, but in the context of collective uh, strong coupling for singlet fission processes. And we pretty much concluded the same thing as you, but we did that in 2018. So, uh, but I think even before like uh, papers on experiments uh, like by Litzi and so on, they, they did definitely uh, consider the case of dissipation. Uh, the, the, the second comment, and maybe it's a question for you, is I quite like this uh, concept of the spectral overlap because it's a very, um, it's a statement that is mentioned all the time by experimentalists because they say, why do I use a very narrow cavity if the molecular line shape is very broad? But then to me, this statement is sometimes a bit confusing and I maybe I would appreciate some clarification about this because uh, the, 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 the breadth of the line shape of the molecular transition is in some sense subjective, right? Like it depends on your spectral resolution. Like what if I really want to, um, to resolve the vibrational states say of your dissociative potential here. So here, my understanding is that, okay, there is like a, a line shape associated to the electronic transition of the magnesium hydride and then I choose a cavity to match that line shape. But, uh, but what is the correct line shape to match? Uh, I imagine it depends on the process you want to control. But for example, like here, I imagine you also can think about the, the line shape of the vibrational bound states of these potentials. So may you clarify a little bit about what is the correct time scale to think about for different situations? That's a good question. Yeah, sorry if I overlooked your paper with the. No, no, no worries. I, I just wanted to comment okay, because I, think, I mean, this I is an I'm... obvious thing. I think that the reason why we were thinking about those things is because when you talk to experimentalists, you necessarily need, they, they, they tell you it's nonsense to think about things without uh, dissipation, right? That's all they think about. So, so that's, that's the only reason, but we were not the first ones like many other people in the doing modeling of spectroscopy, we're obviously thinking about line shapes and, and cavity linkage lifetimes too, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's some, that's, that's those, those things like separately definitely uh, are mentioned all the time. I mean, if you do spectroscopy, of course, people put in uh, lifetimes of states. But I think in, uh, since this, I mean, if you want to include this properly, this is, of course, uh, if you also want to do the dynamics, that's not always so easy to do. I guess that's why it's often skipped, especially in, in sure. theoretical papers. Yeah. Um, okay, so to, to your question, what, what a good line shape is, I think, I mean, why I came up with this idea of line shape is because I heard that earlier in a different context where, where people had a gas and a, colleagues of mine had a gas in a macroscopic cavity and did Raman scattering on that. Yes. And if you have a gas at room temperature, um, you have a velocity distribution, right? You get a Doppler distribution in, in your line shape. And um, they were struggling a bit in the beginning and then saying, okay, well, I mean, we understand how this works. I mean, our, our cavity line width has to uh, basically match the, the Doppler, the distribution, the Doppler distribution line shape of our gas so that we get the maximum Raman scattering out of it because only yes. then we can address um, basically all molecules that we have with the cavity. Yes. If we get that into the, into the molecular context here, I would say perspective is maybe a little bit different. If you think like from the, or I'm coming from the wave packet perspective, 
So if you have a nuclear wave packet on, um, on any kind of state, you're covering a certain energy range or you're covering a certain number of vibrational states, right? Sure. You always have a stupid position of vibrational states. And I would say the uh, energy distribution of your vibrational wave packet is somehow connected to the cavity line width. Sure. I mean, here it's probably a bit more complicated than just to say this has to be a one on one because you have other things going on. Um, since you, you're rushing also over, over those, um, those intersections pretty quickly, and that, that, of course, that, of course, also plays a role. Yes. But then if I, if I want to get that stuff back into the ground state or basically down as quickly as I can, I have to address as much from, of the wave packet as I can at the same time with the, with the cavity line width. I mean, that's, that's my perspective. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. But now let me ask you just if you mind entertaining the, this uh, follow up. So, so I, I guess the question is, uh, line shape is also a matter of resolution, right? So um, I guess if you have, if you are able to collect a spectrum that has a high resolution, then you can start seeing vibrational states or vibronic states. Or uh, so, so I guess the question is, wouldn't there, this statement is slightly ambiguous, right? Like, like to match the line shape of the molecule to the cavity. And I was, I was wondering if you have given more thought about. Uh, I mean, yeah. yeah, it depends, I guess, which state you're looking on. If you look at the dissociative state, then um, your, yeah. your lines, you, you cannot resolve anything. Your lines basically merge, right? Sure. Okay. So I think in that sense, yeah, that, that, that is clear. But okay, so and one very, very quickly. So, so there's always this statement that the photochemistry is being suppressed by strong coupling because of changes in potential energy surface. But you're here, you're showing that the, the suppression is not due to the changes in potential energy surface per se, but due to the changes in lifetime. So for experiments, which one do you think is the correct um, effect that the potential energy surfaces are just a copy of the ground state or that the lifetime of the, of the polaritonic surface is not long enough to allow for anything to happen? Yeah, and the experiment is a good question. I mean, from here for this particular model, I can say that both plays a role because you see this in these two regimes. Mm -hmm. That of course the modification of the potential energy landscape in this model plays a role, right? This is our simple picture. But then you also have an interplay with uh, with the decay. Mm -hmm. I mean, in experiments, yeah, okay. One half. I mean, you have to look at the collective. Where, where are we? Which sure regime are we? In? Yeah, which which regime are we in in the experiments? I mean. Okay, we have done this this paper with Carl uh, Burrison with the the triplet triplet annihilation, and there I think um, I think it, I mean we we couldn't show that, but from from what I've seen from from this model now, I would say there probably it is a big help that you remove population from the excited state via spawn via cavity decay. Okay, so that's you believe that's the main effect. Okay, that I makes sense. It's probably a strong driver. Yep. Also, if you think in terms of a thermal, thermal sample where you have some equilibrium, this definitely can also draw your equilibrium in a, or yeah, can shift the equilibrium at least in a certain direction. I see. Thank you very much. Those are very helpful answers. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So we have we have one more raised hand and a question from the chat. Matt, you may talk. Hi, uh, I just wanted to uh, ask a short follow-up question to uh, what Koel asked. So are you suggesting that maybe an optimal regime is not the strong coupling regime? Like for modifying chemistry, the optimal regime is not strong coupling, but some intermediate regime between weak and strong coupling? I mean, in this particular model, this is kind of where the line falls, I would say, but um, I, I'm not sure if you can generalize that. Okay. This happens, this happens to work in this particular example. 
But um, I mean, it could very well be that in, 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 in other cases too, you see an optimum just right at the edge of the strong coupling regime. I mean, you're still somewhat at, I mean, how do you define strong coupling regime, right? That's not really a sharp boundary. It's more or less like, however you want to look at it in terms of um, dissipation rate um, smaller than, than your internal dynamics. I mean, for, for atoms, this is one definition, but even for molecules, I think uh, you have to tighten up the definition a little bit because um, it matters very much how much time you spend in the region where you even resonant with your wave packet. How much time does the system spend at the points where you're resonant, where you can actually really act on the system with the cavity if, effectively. So that, that definition of strong coupling, I think that, or that at least that, that separating line gets blurred even more a little bit here. Since you also have to consider the, uh, the time scale of nuclear dynamics. Okay, thank you. And we have, uh, so maybe one last question from the chat. Uh, this question is from Eric Fischer and he asks, could you please comment on the possible role of the molecular charge on the dynamics, which would couple the center of mass motion to the cavity modes? Sorry. Um, the role of the charge. Okay, that's a good question here. I don't yeah. think we have looked at this particular um, thing. I don't, I'm not sure I remember correctly which state is which here but um, they're not all dissociating um, equally. There are like um, channels where you dissociate into magnesium plus and the neutral hydrogen and vice versa into neutral magnesium and um, hydrogen plus. Um, yeah, okay, but this, this is something then comes back to if you, if you wanna go all in on the model, then you have to also take into account the, the permanent dipoles. That, yeah, okay, fair enough. I mean, this could make a difference here. I mean, I will show in the next, in the next model where we have, uh, have something similar going on, a bit, a bit more complicated where we actually find this, this also plays a big role in, in the photochemistry sense, yeah. Thank you. I hope, I hope this answers the questions. All right, um, then last but not least, um, the last paper that, or the results of the, the other paper that I want to show is where we actually um, have taken, a, a, let's call it quotation mark, a real molecule and uh, something bigger than just a diatomic and looked at actually um, the interplay of conical intersections of in molecules with, um, together with cavities. So in this case, we have taken the, the parole molecule and we want to look at the photo dissociation of the hydrogen in the presence of a, of a cavity field and see what we can control, what kind of terms of the Hamiltonian actually really play into it and, and how, this, how we can think about this. So again here, um, this is a single molecule model. This is something that at that level of theory we couldn't handle as a multiple molecule model at the moment. And here a little bit, I think the main theme is like which couplings are really important in the end. So just to introduce the model system, we have the parole molecule. And to describe the dissociation here of the hydrogen from the nitrogen, we have chosen two coordinates. We have the, the, in, the dissociation in plane, which basically goes straight out into the y direction. And we have a dissociation out of plane in the 2D model here. Uh, which goes into the x direction. And so we have two coordinates to properly actually describe the, the conical intersection of the system. So what we've done here, um, we've transferred that whole system into a diabetic uh, molecular picture first. So what you see here are basically the uh, two surfaces uh, crossing through each other. So then to couple the whole thing with the cavity, we have our two states, our um, diabetic uh, ground state, and we have the sigma pi star state here, which has a tiny local minimum, which retains a little bit of the 
of the population if you pump it carefully enough and then you dissociate out, you have here uh, a proper conical intersection and then dissociate. And we have done that whole thing for different cavity frequencies. So here we see like for 3.5 electron volts, which is more like, let's say, the electronic regime. And we've gone down all, to, all the way down to 0.28 electron volts, where you can actually almost say, OK, this is almost not purely electronic anymore, but more like at the level where we probably will see effects of vibrational strong coupling also. All right. so. Single molecule model, we have our potential energy surfaces. We have done uh, nuclear wave packets dynamics on it with uh, two nuclear coordinates. And we treat the um, cavity field and field displacement coordinates. So we add basically a third um, coordinate. So in a sense, from a numerical perspective, this basically now handles like a, almost like a three dimensional vibrational model. So the whole thing still is um, basically looking at dipole approximation. So we have all kinds of coupling now in the model. We have electronic transitions in the color, electronic di transition dipole moments, and we have the also the electronic, uh, sorry, the static dipole moments of each of the states in the model now to have a more um, complete description here. And what we've also done is now we have properly taken the self-interaction to account is like where you have the, um, the dipole, the square of the dipole operator also in the, in the model. And that is then our total Hamiltonian three, basically vibrational like coordinates in two electronic states. So now if we calculate the dynamic and we look at the survival property, so i.e. we define a certain area where we say, okay, this area, the molecule is bound and the other, if the hydrogen goes further out, we consider it unbound and basically it will never come back and dissociate. So now we can do this for, for different uh, cavity resonance frequencies, as you see here in the panel, and we also done it for different, um, different field strength or different coupling strength. And then if we look at our very smallest um, cavity coupling strength with a very close actually in the conical intersection, we see that for the bare, black is always here, the bare curve without any cavity. So if we start comparing that, if we go beyond a certain field strength, we see all of a sudden that where we have initially something like a, a lifetime of 100 frames per second, we rapidly shorten that if you beyond a certain threshold. So, and then we get actually very, start to get varying results. So if we go to, to higher cavity resonance frequencies, then what we get is that we actually start extending the lifetime. So we start trapping again um, the, uh, um, the hydrogen and preventing it from dissociating, at least slowing down the dissociation like on a significant time scale here. So that's already very pretty kind of interesting. We can accelerate it, we can, and we can slow it down. So then the next question is like, we have, since we have now all different contributions in the Hamiltonian, let's just dissect it and take it apart and see what happens if we, for example, if we move the self-interaction contribution or if we remove the, the static dipole moments from the model. So if we basically remove the vibrational storm coupling from the model. And this is now for the strongest field strength that we, that we had in the previous slides. So to get a little bit to see the the effects here again. So the black curves, which are not always visible here behind the, the blue curve, that's the, the bare state, so no cavity. Then red is always the full Hamiltonian. In the blue curves, we have removed only the dipole self interaction terms. And in the, in the light blue curve, we have removed the dipole self interaction term and even the vibrational coupling terms, so the, the static dipole moments. And then we see actually that, um, especially here for basically the, the lowest cavity frequency, if we remove the dipole, the self-interaction terms, then we get a completely opposite result compared to the full Hamiltonian. So uh, instead of accelerating, if we decelerate it, and if we even remove the, the vibrational storm coupling, we see that there's pretty much nothing left of our effect, which is 
Also, maybe, maybe not too surprising since the cavity frequency was already low to begin with, where you more start talking to vibrations than rather electronic states. But even in, in all the other cases, we still see that um, we need vibrational, the vibrational comes, the static dipole moments, especially for those high field strength, to get a meaningful result out of it. And at those field strength, uh, you even need the the dipole self and direction terms. Or if you if you drop the dipole self and direction terms, you see that there's actually a big kind of big difference to the full Hamiltonian. So that in itself, I think, was an interesting result. So then the question is like, okay, how does this come along? How can you visualize why this comes along, this holy effect? And so what we did here, we did an approximate um, diagonalization of the potential energy surfaces to get a little bit more of an intuitive feel of how of how the potential energy landscape um, changes under those different terms. And what you see here is like, so in every line we have a different Hamiltonian and in every column we have a different uh, cavity frequency. So and if we look at, uh, for example, our 0.28 electron volts cavity frequency, we compare that full Hamiltonian versus the reduced Hamiltonians, then we see, then we start to understand why we accelerate um, the reaction in the case of the full Hamiltonian. So namely, instead of having this almost original potential energy shape here, we start lifting up the whole potential energy surface. So the whole wave packet has to go out much quicker just by modification of the potential energy surface here. And even, but, but still even for the other um, cases, let's go to the, to the highest uh, cavity frequency here. You can still see that if we go to the compare the the absolutely reduced Hamiltonian with only the electronic coupling terms to the full Hamiltonian you see is that you have a very different shape of the potential energy landscape in the excited state, which starts actually making a difference of how much, how strong you can trap basically your, your hydrogen in, in the parole molecule. So to summarize that part, um, well, what was interesting as a result by looking at that model is that we can see we can accelerate or we can delay. So we can actually control in both directions here. That was nice to see. And we see that, okay, if you go to higher coupling strength or in general that here, um, even though it's still considered photochemistry in a sense that the, the vibrational strong coupling elements start to become important. So your static dipole moments start actually playing a role also. And if you look at the self-interaction term, that basically then also starts playing around with the difference in dipole moments, static dipole moments between different states. So if they're very different, then your static dipole moments probably will also start to play a role. Uh, I thank you for the invitation and I thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Um, so I think we have one question uh, in the chat already. And if there are any questions from the audience, uh, we will take them. So the question is uh, from Eric Fischer. And he asks, when you work in the coordinate representation for the cavity modes, uh, do the derivative couplings with respect to the cavity coordinate enter here? And he was referring to um, the, the, previous, uh, the previous topic. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, let me skip back to that to the slide where we had actually written that down. Yeah, I mean, so they absolutely matter. And in, by means of a quantum chemistry program, you, if you put that properly in, you can just calculate um, um, a finite difference um, derivative with respect to your wave function along the, along the photon displacement coordinate. And, uh, you will you will start seeing those peaks in the in the non adiabatic coupling function. So actually here, I mean, if you calculate this two CBO surfaces, you already have spent your your dipole operator already in the electronic state calculation. So now you cannot calculate the transitions anymore directly by means of the dipole uh, operator. So the transitions between your two CBO surfaces actually now comes purely out of those non-adiabatic couplings. 
I think that's an interesting aspect that might not be immediately obvious when you when you start thinking about it. Thank you. We have one raised hand. Um, Ariel, you may talk. Yes, hello, Marcos. Um, I have a question related to, to the last uh, motivation slide and also going back to the introduction with, uh, with the use of, uh, the, say, diagonalizing both the electrons and, uh, and the photons together. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a, a question of, of basis, right? I mean, you can use um, field-free electronic states and, uh, and then diagonalize uh, the full electronic photonic operator using this field-free basis and the photons. And if you if your electronic basis is uh, is large enough, then it should give you exactly the same result as if you do it all together in let's say inside the Casa CF calculation. Then my question is, um, have you compared the full calculation with then using the field free states and seeing at what point at what coupling strength do you depart? Um, so one one treatment departs from the other. Right, because um, yeah, that, that's the point where actually you really do need the the let's say the the full treatment, but otherwise you don't really need it. That's true. I mean, um, okay, so by full treatment you mean like really the cavity von Oppenheimer treatment, where you put the electronic field already in the electronic structure calculation. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there is. I mean, I haven't done that, but. Um, or, or we only done very we, we've done that very preliminary. Um, just I think at uh, at at a volt per nanometer where the the region where it becomes interesting I would say and where you are like already probably venturing a little bit into the ultra strong coupling regime, like at that region I think that's where it becomes that where you start to see a difference. But if you actually want to have more solid uh, statements on that. Um, there are there are plenty of papers from from uh, Angel Rubio where they actually have have looked at those kind of things from various perspectives and where you start seeing a difference. Right. Maybe a final comment on this. I mean, in a sense, the from an interpretation point of view, it may be useful, but from a computational one, I also have my in a sense my my reservations because. And when we do full quantum dynamics on molecules, actually we tend to try to build diabatic representations because these are much more useful when you are in, in the multidimensional case. Now, if you do the full ionalization, then you have a diabatic, basic diabatic potentials and you need to re-diabatize again if you're going to do full quantum dynamics. Of course, if you're doing some sort of mixed quantum classical, it may be an advantage, but not always. I mean, I would say there are different advantages to it. So as I would say, I mean, you, if you do full quantum dynamics, you can easily also do it with derivative couplings. And I mean, by easily, as long as you have avoided crossings. Um, yeah, in, in the 1D case, you, you can finite, always do that, yeah. Where you have finite derivative coupling matrix elements, then that's not really a problem. I think it becomes a bit more challenging when you, when they, when you start getting to conical intersections where things diverge. Then I agree with you. I would also rather work in a, yeah, probably in a, in a diabatic basis. But I mean, that's that's uh, yeah, that's probably an interesting point. I think you have all those pictures, and I think they they're dependent on what you want to do. They can be equally useful. You have to pick the picture which has all the advantages that you need right now and which that's, puts it on a feasible, on a feasible yes. footing for you. This is, this is precisely my point. And I think in, in the literature, sometimes there are statements that put some pictures on top of, or, or let's say, as more advantages than others or say, well, there is more physics here. And in the end, everything is a question of the basis that you choose. And, and the picture is going to be as useful as, as what you want to do with it. So I that's fully true. agree with you. I mean, the thing is like some, I mean, also from a practic practicality point of view, I mean, what you said, yeah, if you take the full basis, then you can transform them all losslessly into each other, right? So you have uh, unitary transformations between, in principle, between all those pictures, if you do it right. But that's the thing, right? You can, uh, getting that complete basis, especially when it comes to calculating electronic states and you need a lot of electronic states that become can become very difficult. Mm -hmm. 
So in, in that case, it would be, for example, more feasible to put the interaction directly into the Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with the, with the cavity bone of Mohammed surfaces, I think what you can also do is um, put it all in there. And if you run into a situation where you have a conical intersection, then you can perfectly diabetize that. And you only need to diabetize once and not twice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Marcos. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you very much. I think um, this is a good moment to, to wrap the webinar up. So if you allow me, I'll just uh, share my screen for a second. Um, so here. So let's thank Professor Kobalewski again for this very clear and interesting talk. And uh, thank you everyone for your participation today and for your questions. So before closing today's session, I would like to announce the next webinar featuring Professor Jiang Tukalo from MIT Cambridge. The webinar will be held on February 16th at the usual time, 9 a.m. PST. The registration can be made as usual through, the, uh, through uh, this link here or the link in the reminder email we will send later. In the meantime, I wish you, all of you a great month. See you next time. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah.